why do you feel like this is the right time to speak out? Uh, because he has taken advantage of and hurt a lot of people and that needs to stop. So we've been covering the story of London Real and Brian Rose for about a year now from the digital freedom platform scam that raised nearly a million dollars to his current bid for London Mayor. The springboard for all of this was the YouTube channel London Real, which started right, as a two-person show <laughs> with co-host Nick Gabriel. Brian and I used to listen to a podcast called The Joe Rogan Experience. In fact, we still listen to Joe Rogan Experience. And um, we were, we'd meet every now and then in the West End of London. We were talking about philosophy, politics, women, money, everything that two guys do, talk, do discuss. Until one day, Nick was simply gone. Now, Nick has never spoken about what happened back then, until now. I think that was probably one of the things that um, was so difficult for me was the, the abruptness and the callousness nature with which he terminated that relationship. It was just like, done, you've, you've, your usefulness to me is finished. I'm just cutting you out, I'm never speaking to you again. So Nick and I have been in touch since last summer and it never really felt like the right time to record this interview. You know, Brian Rose isn't all bad. The guy taught me many things. I think that's probably part of the allure is that there are certain elements within him that he's working with that are appealing and that do have some truth and goodness to them. The problem is it's just so poisoned by all the other narcissism and, and the huge ego and the total lack of respect and love for and empathy for his, his um, fellow humans. It's a facade. It's literally a narcissistic mask that he wears. Like, I'm this guy who's out to like face my demons and figure out who I am and you know help people and that's why it's so dangerous is because there's this little kernel of truth that he's mimicking and that's that's the that's the act right but if you scratch beneath the surface you will very quickly realize that he is an empty human being and uh, i've often thought about what what is it what is it that's driving that insatiable lust for fame and power and money and it's, it's that, it's this void within him that he is trying so hard to fill. Watching London Real isn't about judgments or conclusions. It's about the journey. To savor every moment, you know, every single minute, there's something going on, and it is all about the journey. So Nick Gregoriades, aka Nick Gabriel, you co-founded London Real. You were the co-host of London Real initially many years ago. Um, and we've been in contact since about this time last year, but now feels like the right time to have this conversation. Um, Indeed. How are you doing and how are you feeling about this chat we're about to have? Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling really good. I know uh, we were, we were going to do a similar chat a year ago. And... Uh, I think we both expressed reservation. It's my understanding your your reservation was you didn't want to give Brian um, more uh, exposure at that point because I think that's kind of what he was feeding off. Is like there's no such thing as bad publicity was probably his motto at the time. Uh, I, in particular, didn't want to give him publicity, but also I was I'd adopted the mindset that speaking out about him and, and what happened was just not really classy. I just thought like, let me just put that to bed. I never really spoke since it happened eight years ago. A lot of people in that time have asked me about it. And um, I just didn't, I just didn't feel it was right to speak out. However, the thing that's caused me to change my mind on that is um, I'm realizing that the guy is, he's taking advantage of people. And if my voice can help a few people not get taken in by him and not, uh, a, lose money, but B, also become corrupted by him, then it's, it's worth speaking out about it. Yeah, and I think both of us have lots of concerns about the impact that Brian's having, the impact that Brian's having on a lot of things that we really care about. Mm -hmm. um, Self-development, personal growth, um, ayahuasca, lots of these, these topics that 
And I would say he's incredibly good at weaponizing those. And mm-hmm. we, so like I said, we first connected last summer and I appeared on your podcast to talk about spirituality, masculinity, and some of the other topics that we share an interest in. Um, and then we've kept in touch since then. And I, I, I agree. We both felt this sort of sense of, is this gossipy? Is this necessary? Is this just drawing more attention to Brian? And what has changed my perspective in particular is like when you're going for political office, if you're going for London mayor, and at the moment it doesn't look like he's likely to, to get there, but he also, but he does have all of this kind of effectively plastering his face all over the city. It's an opportunity to potentially get more people to sign up for the, the courses. So I think that for me changes the calculation as to whether it's uh, whether it's the right thing to do and the and the right time to do it. I, I'm the same. I mean, the, the London mayor thing, that's not really the thing that wants me, that causes me to want to speak out. For me, I've just, just yesterday I was on LinkedIn and I saw a post by some guy who had, um, it was a YouTube video. He had some, some guy who had fallen for one of these uh, business accelerator courses of, of London reels and, and Brian's. And uh, I just saw how much it had hurt him both financially and also uh, his, his pride, you know, he was, he was wounded on many levels. And I just, um, I think that's more the thing that I'm wanting to stop than anything else. And you've never spoken out publicly about what happened around the time uh, of no. the ending of that relationship. No, I've never spoken publicly. This, this is the first time. Do you want to start maybe with where, how it began? Like what, start at the beginning, how it began, and then take us through the story of, of what happened? Sure. I met uh, Brian, I think it was in 2010, if I'm not mistaken. It might have even been a little bit earlier than that. It might have been 2009. Uh, he became a jiu-jitsu student of mine, a private student. I was teaching jiu-jitsu at the Roger Grace Academy in Northwest London. And he started taking private lessons with me. Um, and that's actually a part of the story, which I think is quite interesting, is uh, keep in mind that It'll become apparent later on why this is important, but he never took any group classes. He would only take private lessons with me in particular. And the truth is that um, he was a decent student and we became friends. We, we hung out outside of the context of that particular relationship. We, I think we went for, um, we went for lunch a couple of times. Uh, we, we just hung out, we became friendly. And uh, there was a point I think it was in early or late 2010, if I'm not mistaken, that uh, we were walking in London. We used to take these long walks in central London, actually in the West End, and just talk about life and philosophy and our interests. And at that point, we were both listening to the Joe Rogan experience um, and both enjoying it. And I don't remember which of us said something but one of us said to the other we should do something like that because brian had just left his job as um i don't want to say a banker because that's another one of uh another element of the story that isn't true brian was never a banker he was a stockbroker at a company called icap um and he had just hit his magic number his retirement number where he said i'm going to retire when i make this amount of money and he had made that amount of money and he said i'm out um and that I got to be honest, that was something I really respected and admired. I was like, wow, imagine if I could be retired when I was, I think he was 41 or 40 at the time. And and he was looking for something to do. I was uh, wanting to expand a little bit beyond martial arts. And we decided we should give this thing a go. We should create a a video show slash podcast, which I I came up with the idea of calling it London Real. And um, because that was the premise that the show was built upon. It was authenticity. We were going to be, you know, two reasonably cool guys who had interesting perspectives on the world and just wanted to figure things out. We just wanted to figure out how to become more self-actualized, have more fun, make a bigger impact and just uh, just do something cool. Right. I think that was for me the, the undercurrent that I, I always tapped into with London Real is we're doing something cool. You know, it's like it's avant-garde, it's cutting edge, it's, uh, it's risque, it's exploratory, 
and we're, we're gonna we're gonna make we're gonna do something cool that that hopefully gets us a lot of new friends, ha- helps us enjoy a lot of new experiences, hopefully makes us some money, and uh, that was the premise, or at least that's the premise that I signed up for. That was the the primary thing he brought to the table was the equipment and the venue, and what I bought was my network. At that time, I was a pretty well known jujitsu instructor. I had um, a pretty big network of esoteric and interesting people. And uh, that was kind of the symbiosis that occurred there. So uh, we started working together and very quickly it developed some traction. It became reasonably popular and um, it just grew from there. And then what happened? So I think the turning point was uh, when I, I returned from, I went to the Amazon in December 2012 for an ayahuasca retreat, which was, I always say this, this my life is divided into two periods. It was before that trip and after that trip. I had a, a very profound experience. Um, and prior to that, I could sense there was definitely a lot of contention, a lot of strife within that that working relationship. Things weren't great between Brian and I, but we were still we were still working together. Um, I came back from that and we went and recorded that interview. And um, after the interview, we had a brief chat. The interview was detailing my experiences about um, ayahuasca. I noticed he was quite strange during that that show uh, or during the recording of that show. Um, and then he said to me, oh, well, like we should talk about the future of London Real. And he said, what are, you, what is your, what are your thoughts? And I, I just, I think I said, look, Brian, I don't really know what to do. It's obviously... Um, clear that things aren't great between us um and we'll we'll just need to figure out how to move forwards and uh we kind of left it at that and then he started to do some strange things like he would call me up we, we had a a pretty set routine we'd record one day a week and then get together another day to work on promoting the show um and then one day he just called me and said, hey, I don't need you to record the, the, the interview today. I'm going to get one of my friends to do it, which I thought was a bit odd. I was like, okay, I thought we were co-hosts. But I was like, maybe he wants to, um, you know, just get a bit of fresh energy in the show. Um, and then the next week, the day before our scheduled interview, he called me up and said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take London Real in a new direction. Um, and I kind of knew what he was doing. It was the strangest thing. I remember that phone call. I, I knew what he was doing. But at that point, I think I was just too weak to stand up to him. That, that's the honest truth. I was just too weak. I was too, I think I was a little bit psychologically scattered from, from the ayahuasca experience. I think I was a little bit inexperienced when it came to business. And I didn't know that legally what he was doing was um, not right. And that I had a, a, I could have made a legal case against him. And I basically just said, okay, Brian, I understand. And from that point forwards, he changed all the email addresses um, and prever- basically changed the proverbial locks. I mean, I don't know if he ever changed the lock on the building because I never went back, but everything, all the digital um, things that we had access to, including the email addresses and the shared documents and everything were just totally changed. And he never spoke to me again. Um, there is one, actually, that's not true. He never spoke to me again. He sent me a message a few weeks later when Everyone was saying, where's Nick? Where's Nick? People were starting to ask what had happened to me because he didn't address that. And I got an, a very strongly worded email saying, hey, we need to have a united front when we address the press about what where you've gone. And I just replied to him saying, if anyone asks me, I'm going to tell them the truth. That was um, my response. And I didn't hear from him for uh, many years. In fact, I sent him a, a an email or it might have even been a written letter just saying how disappointed I was in the way things went down and that um, he was someone I really looked up to. Um, I just can't believe I used to look up to that guy, I should, I should mention. Um, and just never spoke to him again. And then funny enough, last year, I think he reached out uh, and we had a reasonably cordial uh, email exchange. But that, that was it. That was it. And I think that was probably one of the things that um, was so difficult for me was the, the abruptness and the callousness nature with which he terminated that relationship it was just like done you've you've your usefulness to me is finished i'm just cutting you out i'm never speaking to you again um i've subsequently realized that that is a hallmark of narcissistic personality disorder it's a it's called the discard and it's a phase in a a relationship between a narcissist and someone else where they have no longer 
no longer found use for that person. They do what's called a discard in which they, uh, there's an abrupt cessation of that particular relationship. Um, and that was, I think, the thing that, that upset me the most, to be honest. And how would you summarize that experience at the time? I was, I was deeply hurt uh, and I was angry with myself for not seeing it. Several people over the couple of years that Brian and I worked on that show had asked me very specifically, I remember it was a very specific question. Two people asked me, do you trust Brian Rose? Um, and strangely enough, I, you know, one of the things I tell people, there's a, there's this theory that people will always tell you who, who they are. In fact, I think the quote is by Maya Angelou. She says, people will show you who they are. So, so believe them the first time. And I remember Brian gave me a book uh, at one point. It was called PIMP, P-I-M-P, by a gentleman named Iceberg Slim. And he gave me this book and he said, this is the most important book you will ever read. So I took the book home and I read it and um, I was pretty disgusted by it. It was all about a, a literal pimp. It was his autobiography of how he used to um, use women, how to extract the most value out of them as literal as prostitutes, and then how to discard them and find the next one. And it was his manifesto, basically. I mean, at the end of the book, he, there was some kind of redemption um, and he did change his ways. But I remember thinking to myself, this is weird. A lot of Brian's behavior seems to mimic the stuff in this book. And I remember thinking to myself, surely he cannot possibly think that this is a good way to move through life. Like surely he can't. But looking back, I realized that's exactly what he does. He, I mean, he uses people. Uh, there was another point where we were talking about, he had a, a business, something that fell out between him and a business, a business associate when he was a stockbroker. And I remember him getting really frustrated and he said, I don't get it. It's just business. Why can't people understand that it's just business? And that to me set an alarm bell off as well. Um, I realized this, this guy he has no value for human beings. It's, it's, what, it's just what they can get out of him. That's what a relationship is to him. It's like, what can this person do for me? Um, and I think to me, if I had to sum up everything, David, I'm just so disappointed in myself that I, I didn't see that more, more clearly. Um, I think largely I have a, a part to play, which was that I was, I was pretty blinded by, by the wealth. Like he was very successful. He had a lot of the things that I thought I wanted at the time. Um, and also there was obviously something within me that he was able to manipulate something unhealthy within me that he was able to manipulate and pull the strings, you know? And um, now that I'm a lot more psychologically healthy, it's, it's almost laugh. Like when I see the guy, it's almost laughable to me that I ever, ever respected him in any way, let alone looked up to the guy. Um, but uh, there is one other thing I have to say that I, I was thinking a lot about this interview and, and, you know, Brian Rose isn't all bad. The guy taught me many things. Uh, he, he taught me a lot about work ethic. He is an incredibly hardworking individual. Um, he did teach me how to raise my game professionally and do things in a very professional manner. There's no way he would have built London Real to what it was. And there's no way he and I would have started it off um, and made it such a, an early success if we hadn't both, if I hadn't adopted his work ethic and his um, sense of professionalism. So I think that's probably what part of the allure is that there are certain elements within him that he's working with that are appealing and that do have some truth and goodness to them. The problem is it's just so poisoned by all the other narcissism and, and the huge ego and the total lack of respect and love for and empathy for his, his um, fellow humans. Yeah, because that's the interesting thing is that I, I was interested. I, I met Brian once when Jamie Wheel went on his show a while ago. And at that time, I was interested potentially to get Brian on, on Rebel Wisdom because I'd seen enough like I, I kind of thought uh, there's a there's obviously this real corporate side, but there's also the ayahuasca documentary and this sort of sense of, oh, he's got the capability to kind of look at himself and um, which I was kind of intrigued by. And it's fascinating to see, firstly, how little of that there is and how little of that there's been since this time last year and the digital freedom platform and all of that sort of where things seem to have definitely turned. Um, but also, I know we wanted to cover as this sort of 
the weaponization of stuff like that, like the ayahuasca experience, like the personal growth mentality, all of this stuff that just seems to be quite easily turned into something else as a as a as a money making thing for London Real and Brian Rose. One of his former employees reached out to me several years ago, and we were discussing this. And what, one of the things he said, an observation he made, is that Brian Rose is literally empty. He's an empty human being, right? There's an expression. It's one of the one of my failings is that I, I speak too much with I, I quote too often, but it is a very powerful quote, which is some people are so poor that all they have is money. And I think with Brian Rose, he is he's a shell of a human being. He's literally like this narcissistic husk of a human being. And what he does is he mimics. He doesn't create anything intrinsically from within himself. He has no connection to the source. So he sees people who have something valuable and something real and mimics it. He's mimicking the truth and then packaging and trying to sell to people. But it's a facade. It's literally a narcissistic mask that he wears. Like, I'm this guy who's out to like face my demons and figure out who I am and you know help people. And that's why it's so dangerous is because there's this little kernel of truth that he's mimicking. And that's that's the that's the act, right? But if you scratch beneath the surface, you will very quickly realize that he is an empty human being. And uh, I've often thought about what what is it? What is it that's driving that insatiable lust for fame and power and money? And it's it's that. It's this void within him that he is trying so hard to fill. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that big billboard of his face that's appearing everywhere in London was just the desire to have his face on a big billboard. I mean, I doubt it's because he really wants to be mayor of London. Um, I know he probably does because that will lead to more exposure and more um, fame and whatever else it is he's looking for. But the truth about that guy is that he is so empty that he feels that fame, power, money, adulation will fill that within him. And that's the craziest thing is that he is, he is telling people, I have fulfillment to sell you. And he literally has none of it. And uh, I just find that it's almost comical. It's, it's almost, it's, it's a tragic comedy, to be honest. Yeah, the irony of, this is why it feels kind of compulsive almost, because he's, he's put himself in a situation where he will be scrutinized. And there's so much for people to, to scrutinize. But it, it is also, I think you're right about when I saw those billboards, it's like, yeah, there are very few things that you can do. And a political campaign is one of the only ones where you can have a billboard of yourself and say, this, Brian Rose, Brian Rose will solve everything. Like even when you're, when you're running a business, it's not just about you. It's about whatever the business is doing. Politics is the only is the only frame, the only excuse for putting like, just yourself up front as the thing and so it kind of makes perfect sense but it doesn't what doesn't make sense is i I just cannot i just can't understand how he thought he was going to go through an election campaign and not and not be scrutinized and not be held up and not and his backstory not be kind of exposed um one other thing you said about i think for, for you and i we kind of look at him we kind of laugh But it's clearly not the case. I mean, we just watched uh, a video of his volunteers. One idea why you love being in the volunteer army. For me, it's the mission. Namida, what is it for you? It's uh, Brian Rose's belief in freedom of speech. I'll tell you what, it's integrity. And no other politician's got that. Brian's got it in spades. Super important. It's about a true leader who is conscious, is not afraid to look into his own shadows, to be human and relates to people as people. And it's, it was extraordinary to watch it because the things that they were saying, one of them said, he's a man who's looking at his shadow. Another one said, he's all about freedom of speech. Another one said, Brian Rose has got authenticity in spades. And it's like... <laughs> that, that is the um, literal definition definition of the cliched statement nothing could be further from the truth nothing could be further from the truth um he is 
you know, when I look at him now, you know, he always was trying to project this issue of, uh, sorry, this image of being a tough guy, you know, like, you know, he's a fighter. That's why he's putting like um, videos up of him punching the, the punch bag and like break dancing and doing these raps. And it, he's got this kind of strange fascination with hip hop and, and gangster culture from, um, from the South side of Los Angeles, actually, which is where I'm at the moment um, or from South central LA, which don't get me wrong. I get it. Like, this very cool stuff to be learned from all those guys, all those black dudes who've made it out here despite, um, you know, discrimination and poverty. And I get that. It's something to be admired. But Brian kind of thinks he's one of those guys. And the truth is he's just a wealthy dude from <laughs> from uh, Southern California, you know? I mean, he, he's, he comes from a wealthy background. He's not a tough guy. And that ties into the other thing, which was, um, you know, he, he would always come, as I said in the beginning, he would always come do private lessons, but he would never go to the group classes. And what I realized is someone said to me, it's because his ego is too fragile. He couldn't face losing to some, one of the other students, right? But like, let's say he's training with me, that's safe because he's paying it as a transaction. And I, if he beats me, I'm the black belt instructor, that's okay. But if he goes into the class and loses to another one of the white or blue belts, it, it was just too much for him. And I remember, um, I always found that strange, but now I understand what it is. It's this, it's this desperation to be seen as a strong man and <laughs> that's what this whole thing is built upon it's like he, that little wounded child within him is so desperate for recognition and love and you know all those things we crave and for some reason he couldn't find it because it's again i don't know what happened in his childhood i know there was some issue and i'm not judging the man for it i had difficulties in my childhood almost all of us did but the problem is, instead of addressing it in a healthy way, he's addressed it in, it's kind of turned in on itself. It's become twisted and it's turned into this caricature, which is this, look at me, look at me. I need power. I need this. I need that. And again, we all have these elements within us. There are all times when we have acted narcissistically. There are all times where we've acted with braggadocio and bravado. There, we, we all have times when we've acted in those ways. But the issue with Brian, which I think is dangerous, is that now this level of fame and um, influence has basically poured gasoline on the fire of that particular thing. And unfortunately, he did not have the ability to observe it and check that aspect of his ego. So now that fire is raging out of control. And the result that we have is someone who's seeking absolute power and absolute authority. This, I mean, he's not going to be mayor, but if he did, I think that would just be the first step. And I don't know what the next step would be, but um, I think it's pretty scary. And <laughs> it's pretty scary. And I truly hope that those people that we saw in that video today, I just hope they see the truth of what he is. And I hope he sees the truth of what he is, because that's the only way this this will ever be resolved. There is another reason I, I actually wrote this down on my on my notes for today, but I, I forgot to address it. Uh, there is something that's very close to my heart, which is plant medicine in, in particular, ayahuasca. Um, and I think Brian has, is really the, the way he represents himself in the world is, is really giving that medicine a bad name. You know, I used to, I used to think that plant medicine was a, a cure-all and that I couldn't understand how I'd meet certain people who drank ayahuasca and there was still for want of a better way of putting it, they were still shitty people. I couldn't, I was like, why hasn't the medicine fixed this person? Like surely it showed them the darkness within them or showed them what was wrong and what, where they were being inauthentic. And what I realized is that it's ultimately just a tool and that you can use this tool, but if you don't do the work, not only will it not help you, can actually turn in on itself and become uh, something negative, but that is not a function of the medicine. And it's not an issue with the medicine. It's an issue with the, the person using it. I've seen people who have literally fallen to the dark side of their own egos through ayahuasca because they didn't check themselves, right? They, they, they literally drank the, they drank the Kool-Aid, figur figuratively drank the Kool-Aid and literally drank the ayahuasca. And I think that that, keep in mind, if you are considering doing ayahuasca and you look at someone like Ryan Rose and think, well, he's still stuck in his ego and he's still a a total narcissist why didn't help him it's not the medicine it's the fact that that ego was so strong and so dark and that person was so unwilling to face the truth that 
it turned in on itself. So I, I just really wanted to get that message out there. Yeah. I mean, I can find a level of empathy for that because there's such like, and I think Brian is in some ways a kind of archetypal figure, like, like it, it's an extraordinary thing to see. And this gap between the Brian in his head and the Brian that everyone else sees <laughs> is so huge. And I wonder what happens when that collapses, if that collapses, like that's a pretty painful position to be in. And I don't know. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know how that plays out. I, I kind of, I assume that would happen last year at the end of the whole digital freedom platform thing, when his whole audience turned on him and it looked like he was, he was kind of spiraling downwards in terms of like his his own yeah his reputation online but it's it's extraordinary and it's like it's compulsive you can't keep your eyes off it <laughs> it is uh it, if i'm not mistaken uh it was osho who said that the problem with the ego is that it's incredibly heavy to carry around right and i think you know, I'm going to be honest with you, David, there was a period where for many years I was very angry with what happened with Unreal when I saw Brian's this, like, this apparent success of it. I'm now starting to realize that that, again, that itself is a mask and a facade. But when I saw the apparent success of London Real, I, I kind of, um, I was more than a little bit angry and resentful and more than a little bit jealous. But what I realized now is he is carrying such a huge weight right? Because he's not acting from a place of authenticity. So not only is he having to keep track of all these lies that he's telling to others, he's lying to himself, right? And that is a very, very heavy burden to carry. I remember Brian never used to sleep well at night. He always had issues sleeping. And I'm starting to realize that that's a consequence. That's a function of, of living life this way, of, of um, screwing people over and moving through the world, seeing what can I get out of people and and then just ditching them once you've used them, it, it it affects your sleep, right? You carry that that debt some way or another, what expresses some way or another, because I think you and I are both of the same opinion that we're part of one whole. And if you hurt one of someone else, if you hurt the other, you are ultimately hurting the whole, which means you're hurting yourself, right? It's and I think that that's the thing that Brian doesn't really understand because he is so divorced from his spirit, he's so divorced from the source that he thinks we live in this scientifically materialistic world in which there are no consequences for screwing someone over because we are all just these organisms that are striving to get resources and power. And he doesn't see the interconnectedness of all, all, all things. He doesn't feel that interconnectedness. And that's what allows him to just lie to people and use them and abuse them. And um, man, that never ends well. It never ends well. If you watch every, if you watch every movie, if you read every book uh in which there's the narrative the uh, kind of narrative of uh um, light versus dark or there's a there's a, a story the bad guy always gets in in the end he always does you know sooner or later there's there's a series of cosmic checks and balances that must be addressed and i think that's what's starting for brian you said to me recently that the walls are closing in and i think the the more the walls close in the harder he's going to fight the more lies he's going to make up the bigger he's going to try to to go. I think the, the mayor thing was like one last swing for the fences. Like, okay, I've conned all these people out of this money. That didn't work. I'm starting to lose my audience. Uh, what can I do? How can I double down? And obviously that's what he thought he could do. And even if he does become mayor, it's going to present with it a whole bunch of uh, challenges because he's operating from a wound, right? If you look at the source of where he's drawing everything from it's coming from a wound it's not coming from a good place and so that will keep being amplified in the circumstances and events that he attracts to himself so i don't know man um he's in for an interesting an interesting ride i think yeah i mean you mentioned the walls closing in that was when um i think i sent over the video that dorian yates did so dorian yates is a long-term london real guest who was going to do a, an Instagram live with Brian and then pulled out because he wanted to ask Brian about the digital freedom platform. He wanted to ask him about the complaints about the courses and Brian refused to talk about it. So Dorian Yates basically pulled out and said, no, I'm not going to do it anymore. I didn't think um, it was wise to go ahead with the call um, and associate my name with something people 
are not happy with. That, for me, shows the walls closing in because I just don't see where Brian goes. I mean, every time he announces that he's going to do an interview with this person, this person is now going to be... Um, people, are, people are watching him. There's whole there's Facebook groups, there's Reddit threads, all of whom are really pissed off at him, who will then get in touch with, say, Dorian Yates or someone else and say, you need to ask Brian this question if you go on. And I don't see there's any getting away from that now because, yeah, mm. anyone with a publicist, anyone with a press officer who will Google Brian or will, will um, have any kind of research whatsoever will see that he's damaged goods. That's an interesting question. I think the the issue is that because the well, I guess is... I was more interested in because you said that you the Dorian Yates was one of your contacts originally. Sure, I mean, almost all the guests initially, uh, of the vast majority of them were from my network. Um, I think the issue, and this comes back to a lot of the things that you've addressed in your work, which is that the internet has allowed that will the democrat democrat democratization of technology has allowed people like Brian, Brian to have a voice that isn't necessarily as scrutinized as it should be. So while there may be certain people that um, have spoken out, there might be a Vice article, there might be negative uh, reviews of his courses online, there's still, uh, the average person could just type in Brian Rose and they're on YouTube and they're presented with videos that paint him in a very, very good light. And without a reasonably deep search, they might never stumble across, uh, upon the things that um, show the truth about him. And to answer your question, you said, where, did, where does he go from here? I think that's the issue is he can still pivot and still do things because, for example, those people that we saw in the video who are giving him all this adulation and, and unchecked adoration, obviously haven't seen the truth because it's just not been in their... Um, in their sphere of influence, right? It just they haven't read the Vice article, or they haven't watched Rebel Wisdom, or they haven't been exposed to the things that show the truth. So, unfortunately, I think there are a few more corners of the internet where he can he can run to before um, ultimately uh, there's no one else to sucker or there's no one else to trick. But uh, I think we have yet to see that. I, I think it's going to take a year or two, at the very least. Yeah, I think it's worth recapping because there may be some people watching this who haven't been following the story over the last couple of years or so. So the, the big thing was the digital freedom platform. So we had David Icke on, who he knew was going to say something pretty controversial. David Icke said that COVID was a hoax, uh, that 5G was designed to create a mass cull, which he knew he was going to say. So he, he knew that YouTube were going to be forced to take that video down. This was at the beginning of the pandemic. So YouTube took that video down, then Brian Im immediately pivoted to, I'm being censored by the big tech platforms. I need to create this digital freedom platform, which will be for the people, by the people. And then th that's when I got involved and I was like, hang on, this is, a, this is a fundraiser for something that is fully owned by you, by Longstem Limited. That blew through a million dollars very quickly. After all of this, he was saying, oh, we're going to add blockchain technology. We're going to take YouTube to court all of these things just to keep keep the, the amount going. Then he made the mistake of saying, well, actually now we need 250,000 foot to keep this thing running. And this thing was just a plug into his own website. Mm -hmm. So his own audience then turned on him in a major way. Then that's when the Vice article came out and it looked like he was done. But then subsequent to that, the London mayor thing started up and that's that's basically where we are now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know what to say, man. Um, I, I think that uh, people like you are doing good work. Kofizel is doing great work on this as well. Um, you know, I think karma will ultimately sort this out. At least that's my hope. I remember when this first happened, the thought that kept running through my mind was, I just hope people see the truth about Brian Rose. And I think I think they will sooner or later. You can only wear a facade or, or carry a, an egoic burden that heavy for so long before it crushes you. I mean, you can see his behavior has become increasingly erratic. Um, he's, you can see, like when you look at his face, a friend of mine sent me a message the other day with a screenshot of Brian um, from something that was on on 
online and he said, just look at his face and you can see like it is weighing heavily on him. The guy looks like 20 years older than he is. Um, it's, I just wouldn't want to be Brian Rose right now. That's for sure. Hmm. And how did the London Real project change when you left? Well, I think I didn't really watch any of it for years. I mean, that's how much of a wound that was to me. I just literally put it out of my consciousness. Uh, and it was only last year that I started um, watching a few of the videos and and seeing what he had done. And I, I think the production values are absolutely superb. Um, I think he basically scaled everything up and doubled down on, on professionalism. And But I think what it really changed is something we I, I knew we would have had to address in this conversation was when Brian became involved with Dan Pena, which... Um, your wife says you're a slut that you're living with. How you know, it, for those of you who don't know, he's a, an alleged... Uh, he, I think he claims to be a, bill, a billionaire or he claims to be an incredibly wealthy individual. And now he runs these uh, self-development boot camps, which teach you how to market your services. And, uh, you know, I've never met Dan Pena, but God damn, does that guy have a creepy vibe. You can't help yourself. You ought to go, okay, go home, mother. Boom, boom. Kill your fucking parents, metaphorically speaking, of course. And it's clear that Brian attended his courses and is modeling himself on this guy. I mean, remember I said to you earlier, Brian is an empty individual who has to mimic. And you can see by the way Brian dresses and Brian started wearing those gangster pinstripe suits and how he cannot see how ridiculous that looks. I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's literally a caricature of like a 1920s mobster. Um, and so I think that that was another turning point. I think up until that point, you know, Brian might have actually come out of this. He might have seen the truth of the issues that he had to face from his childhood or whatever they might have been. And he might have come out of this and become a force for good. But I think that's where he almost uh, like in Star Wars when Anakin, like, you know, finally like just gives into the dark side of the force and says, this is the path I'm, cho I'm choosing. I think that's that was the point when he started working with Dan Pena. And since then... You know, it's, it's almost like he said, the gloves are off, like I'm going for it. I'm going to do whatever it takes to achieve my objectives, whether that means, I don't want to say stealing from people because he hasn't stolen from anyone. But if you look at the reviews of the things on his webs, uh, on, on Trustpilot and ScamGuard, there's clearly some people who are very dissatisfied with what they received when they signed up for his courses. Um, I can't speak to, I haven't taken one of his courses, so I can't speak well, to the, their the most, The most damning thing, if you want to just sort of say, kind of to for kind of being careful of kind of legal issues of kind of, okay I'm not going to say they're a scam but the credit cards the way that people have got their money back from this is that they've got the credit card to refund it by telling the credit card that it was it was missold and proving to the credit cards companies uh proving to the credit card companies agreement that it was missold and you've got to imagine like they You've got to imagine that the credit card company is not going to give a refund unless you can pretty much prove that there was um sure yeah deliberate mis-selling involved sure i i agree um i think another thing that's telling is that um it's my understanding he has a, a team working full-time to scrub all negative comments uh, from any of his content on youtube and twitter and and uh, the other outlets which you know again it's this it's this comical thing that he is presenting himself as literally the opposite of what he is he speaks about freedom of speech right like that's his whole thing is he was defending the the common man's freedom of speech and he will defend it till his dying breath if that's the case why is he deleting comments that are critical of him and what he's doing right it's obvious like the a man who has nothing to hide has no reason to to do that right and yeah i just Again, this comes down to like, you can't fight the whole internet, right? Like he's trying now, he's hired these people to delete these comments. But if, if you pick a fight with the internet, the internet's going to win. Like it's just the facts, right? And I think that's ultimately what will, will be his downfall is eventually um, there'll be enough of a turning of the tide and 
there won't be any corners for him to hide in anymore and the word will be out. But again, as I said, it's it might take a, a long time for that to happen. And we've heard your side of the story. What would Brian say about the time that you, about the reasons for the split? But that is an excellent question and I'm very glad you asked that. Uh, I think he would say that I was difficult to work with because I'd never had any um, professional or I had very little professional experience. I'd never really worked in corporate for any extended period of time. And I was a jiu-jitsu instructor. And so um, I didn't have the work ethic that he did, that he had. I didn't have the, um, yeah, I just didn't have the professional abilities that he had. So I was the student who was like, yeah, this is going to be a cool, fun project. And let's just go with it and see how it works. And he was like, let's just do this. Like, um, so he probably said I didn't work hard enough. He probably said I didn't want it as badly as he did. Um, he'd probably say I wasn't as committed as he was. And there's probably some truth to all of those. There's probably some truth to all of those. Um, I, I mean, I've thought about this over and over again for many years. And if I look at the way I conducted myself during that time, I can walk away with my head held high. I mean, even though I had those specific failings, nothing I ever did was with ill intention or I was never dishonest. And, um, you know, I did, I did put a lot of work in, definitely not as much as him, but I did put a lot of work into that project and I did bring a lot of value to it. So, you know, I, I can walk away with my head held high. And so what, what is your biggest regret or biggest um, pain about that time? David, in all honesty, I don't have any regrets anymore. And I have uh, literally dealt with the pain of it. It was last year, 2020, that I it hit a point when when it really, when the David Icke um, interview started to come out and people were just calling me out of the blue saying, have you seen this? And I was like, ah, oh, this is just a part of my life. I want to forget. But I realized I had to face it and deal with, with that wound. And in all honesty, I'm just, I'm so happy with what happened with London Real. Like, I met a lot of great people. It's led to connections with people like yourself. Um, I, I dated a lot of girls because of it, to be, to be brutally honest. I uh, went on the Joe Rogan experience. I, I like to feel I impacted a lot of lives positively. I learned a lot. I learned, as I said, I learned a lot from Brian. I learned a lot from the guy. He has many, many good elements to him. Um, so, and I've dealt with the pain of the wound and I've seen my, my role in, in that relationship and the failing of it. And, I'm just grateful that it ended when it did, because if, as a friend of mine said to me recently, he said, just imagine if you had stayed on board and Brian had convinced you to become complicit in all the things that he's doing now. I mean, your, your reputation would be destroyed. And to answer you, I, I have no regrets and no more pain surrounding that. I'm, I'm just grateful for all of it. And what, yeah, I know that we've talked about this in the, the other podcast that we recorded for your channel, but I'm, just interested in what your values are, just to get a sense of yourself and where you're at now. What are you What are you doing, and what are your What are your values? I think my number one value is authenticity. Right, I'm, I'm just trying to be authentic, not just with people, but with myself. I'm, I'm just really I'm just really searching total authenticity, which is a fucking difficult thing to do. Um, you know, I I was talking to a friend a couple of days ago about this. Like, I have the mission that I've created for myself in life is it revolves around two things. The first is to have fun. I want to have fun. I want to have fun with my life. Like, um, and the second is I want to leave this world a better place than when I arrived. Um, and as long as everything I'm doing doesn't violate, um, either of those two things, I, I think I'm, I'm living my values. Uh, and, and as long as I'm being authentic. So, yeah, that's that's kind of what my values are and, and what I what makes me feel like I'm in alignment. And is there anything that we haven't covered yet that you think we should? Uh no. Um obviously uh if if people want to talk about uh if, if people want to find out more about my work, I suggest they head to liberationmentor.com and they can listen to my podcast there. I have a book that I just released on uh what I believe are are the 20 most important principles for living life as an actualized man. It's called Aligned. You can find it on Amazon. You can also get a free copy on my website. 
I would say to anyone who's considering working with Brian Rose, uh, a lot of people have said to me they had a gut instinct about him when they first started engaging with him that they that they intellectually overrode. Um, so I would say when you when you are considering working with him, trust your gut, trust your instincts, listen to that small voice. If there's a warning or if something feels off, just listen to that. And how would you summarize your position in relation to him now? Like, why do you feel like this is the right time to speak out? Uh, because he has taken advantage of and hurt a lot of people and that needs to stop. Nick, I hope we stay in touch. I really enjoyed our conversation that we recorded on the podcast and I really hope that your work, I, I, I've really enjoyed your authenticity and the, the depth that I felt in the conversations that we've had for a year now, like genuinely kind of wrestling with whether it's the right time to speak and what, what your role and what your responsibility is. And I know this is something that you take very, very seriously. And I've been really, um, yeah, I hope, firstly, I hope we get to meet in person sometime we will. in the not too distant future and that we stay in touch. You as well. I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, David.